asking the United States Supreme Court to accept this case and to hear their, uh, their lawsuit. And so that, this play covers that, and so we really appreciate you being here today. And afterwards, we'll have a very short talk back, and for those of you who might be watching at home, you can follow the conversation at hashtag bringjimthorpe home, or hashtag howlround, or hashtag my father's bones. Lots of options. Um, but without further ado, we'll get started, and it's just really a pleasure to be here in the Twin Cities and to be able to work with such a talented pool of Native actors and artists who live here in the city and work to tell Native stories for our communities every day. And so I'm really honored to introduce Rihanna Yazi, who is a playwright and a director who works with the New Native Theatre Company. Hi, my name is Rihanna Yazi. I'm uh, the artistic director of New Native Theater. We are um, the uh, Native Theater here in the Twin Cities, um, heading towards a uh, professional 501c3 status. And we've been here in the Twin Cities for about, um, since 2009. And uh, our company, we produce original commissions. Um, we make devised work with the community around social justice and cultural subjects. We also bring in tours from other First Nations and Native American theater companies throughout the continent. Uh, so we're honored to be here at NCAI's mid-year conference to present My Father's Bones um, by Mary Catherine Nagel and uh, Suzanne Schoen Harjo. And I'm gonna introduce the actors. Um, I will start here. Uh, Inez Dakoto, Donovan Mountain, Brian Joyce, Jeff Jordan and Francisco Benavides. Thank you. The Sac and Fox Nation. Jack stands in a cemetery. He's surrounded by tombstones, each one displaying the name of a sibling, aunt, uncle, grandparent, or other relative. So here we are. This is it. These are the trees that surrounded him. Can you hear them? The birds? Those are the birds that sang to him. Oh, in the sky, that big pink Oklahoma sky, and the red earth. My dad played in this earth when he was a kid. This is home, my home, his home. We were born in this dirt, and when we die, we go back to this dirt. Or at least that's what dad wanted. Grandpa and grandma, they're here now. Over there, that's my auntie, my dad's brother, my uncle. Some of my cousins, dad's twin, died when he was nine, and he's buried right there. We're all here, except dad. They took him, buried him far away from here, someplace they named Borough of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, a place he'd never even seen. My dad, you may know him, or maybe you think you know him. Sure, he was famous, and yeah, he won some gold medals at the Olympics, but that didn't change who he was. My dad, he was always Sack and Fox, Thunder Clan of the Sack and Fox Nation. And that's one thing you should know about us Indians. We're no different than white people or any other folks. We want to bury our loved ones with our loved ones, with our mothers, our fathers, and our brothers. Dad always said, he told me, Jack, when I pass, when I take the journey, I want to be buried at Sack and Fox, the Sack and Fox way. So I gave him my word. I made him a promise. The Sack and Fox burial ends on the fourth day when elders hold the name return ceremony. In our way, we give our people their clan name at birth or in early childhood. And when that person passes, that name is returned to the clan. After the ceremony is concluded, the person can be laid to rest. I was 16 when Dad passed, but I remember the fourth day as though it were yesterday. 1953, Sack and Fox Nation, Jim Thorpe's funeral. Jack, now 16 years old, and Bill, 25, stand together they sing a Sack and Fox prayer song. After some time, a highway patrolman enters, followed by Patsy. They interrupt the song and the entire ceremony. What are you doing? I've come to take him. Take him? Take him where? He's cold, too cold. We haven't finished the ceremony. Put him in the hearse. Now? Yes. I think they're praying. I said put him in the damn hearse so we can get the hell out of here. You can't interrupt the name return ceremony. I don't have time for this Indian nonsense. She can't take him. We didn't finish the ceremony. Where is she taking him? I don't know. A 
promise is a promise, we'll finish the ceremony and bury him at Sack and Fox. May 1954, East Mock Chunk, Pennsylvania. The mayor and Patsy sit in a local diner, sipping on two cups of coffee. How's your coffee? Fine. We don't have much in this sleepy little town, but this diner, it's something we're proud of. <laughs> Lukewarm, really? Oh. Tastes like it was brewed yesterday. Oh, well, we can't have that. Matt! Yes? Get our guests some coffee. Some real coffee, not your leftover pot of coffee. Yes, sir. He's new. He must hate his job. Oh, no, I'm sure he loves it. I mean, there's nothing else here. The mines closed all of them just over five years ago. Without them, well, let's just say everyone around here is looking for a job. Matt's lucky he found one. Matt returns with a cup of coffee. He hands it to Patsy. He waits to see her reaction. With deliberate delay, she brings the cup to her lips, sips, and then she smiles at him. He exits. I have a contract here ready for you to sign. How much you gonna give me? You want compensation? I'm giving you his body. Yes, but we agreed to change our name. We're renaming our town. From now on, it's going to be called the Borough of Jim Thorpe. My husband's famous. I'm aware of his medals. So when you name your town after him, you're going to make money. I think it's all fair that I get a piece of it. Matt returns to the table with their breakfast. I ordered eggs. Yes. I didn't say scrambled eggs. Oh. If I wanted eggs scrambled, I would have said so. How would you like your eggs? The way I ordered them. OK. Take these back to the kitchen. I'm sorry. I, I thought you said scrambled. Clearly, I didn't. <clears throat> we would be more than happy to compensate you for your husband's body, but we need you to agree that this agreement is binding. I said I'd sign. What more do you need? Your agreement that this contract binds not only you, but all of his heirs. You OK with that? Fine by me. When do I get paid? Uh, when do you need it? Now, Matt returns with a plate of eggs served sunny side up. What's this? Your eggs? I said poached. Poached eggs. Not scrambled, not sunny side up. I'm so sorry. I can't eat this. Please, poach us some eggs. Yes, sir. I'm really sorry about this. Matt is usually one of our best. The mayor. He smiles, then places a contract in front of Patsy and hands her a pen. She signs. What? I just thought we might shake. I signed. We don't need to shake. Where do you want the body? Where? When? Maybe in a month or two. I need to leave it with you today. You brought it with you? I'm done driving it around. Uh, let me just... Call the morgue. What about your mausoleum? I can't take him there. I thought you said you were going to store him in a mausoleum. We haven't built it yet. I guess you better get started. He's not my problem anymore. One month later, Patsy sits at her kitchen table. Jack enters and sits next to her. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. You have five minutes. I'm here to talk about Dad. Four minutes and 45 seconds. We need to finish his ceremony, his burial ceremony. You interrupted it. Four minutes and 30 seconds. We promised he would be buried at Sack and Fox. That's what he wanted, and we said we would do it. Four minutes and 20 seconds. Talk to me. Patsy, where is he? You need to bring him back. I sold him. What? To a town in Pennsylvania. They're going to show him off. Your dad's famous. He deserves recognition. And it's about time I made some money from his name. I'm opening a hotel. Jim Thorpe's Teepees. Kind of has a ring to it, don't you think? Where is he? I told you, Pennsylvania. I signed a contract. You, you have to get him back. Tell him you made a mistake. I made no mistake. 
But you were there, Bill, Richard, all of us. We were sitting around this table and you agreed. You said you remembered him saying he wanted to be buried at Sack and Fox. You think I care about what he wanted? Well, I, yes, I thought maybe you would. The biggest mistake I made in my life was marrying him. My mother warned me. She said, Patsy, don't marry that man. Once a redskin, always a redskin, even when he's famous. <laughs> but I was stupid. I thought it'd be glamorous. I thought we'd eat oysters and drink wine and live the high life. But I never got to enjoy any of that life. I'd tell him, you're famous, Jim. You have fans, millions of them. You won gold medals, for Christ's sake. Go put your face on a billboard, sell some soap, or cars, or beer. Huh, we could have been millionaires. But did he care about making money? No. That's not what's important to me, Patsy. He used to say, Sure, not important to him, but what about me? No way in hell is your dad going to leave this world without giving something to me. I deserve it. She exits. My father's name was Watha Huck, or as you would say in English, the bright path the lightning makes as it goes across the sky. He was the most incredible athlete of the 20th century. Most remember him for the gold medals he won in the 1912 Olympics. He won both the decathlon and the pentathlon, a feat no one's ever duplicated. His scores in the combined 15 events were off the charts. He set records that took decades to break. But what do you remember my dad for? The medals that he won? The records that he broke? Or the town that changed its name to his? Me, I just remember him as dad because that's who he was. That's what was important to him. The Mayor's Office in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, 1986. You must be Jack. Principal Chief Jack Thorpe. Principal Chief? of the Sovereign Nation, Sack and Fox Nation. I'm here to collect my father. I don't think that's possible. We signed a contract. He never signed anything. His wife did, and we lived up to our end of the bargain. That's about as American as you can get. He wanted to be buried with his family at home. Thanks to us, Americans still remember him. They drive through our sleepy little town just to see his grave, and there they read about his achievements. This isn't what he wanted. He wanted to be buried at his home. This is his home now. You're standing in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. We named it after him. He has, he has his own zip code. Watho Huck. Uh, what? His name is Watho Huck. The mayor exits. I spent years trying to bring Dad back. I begged, I pleaded, I prayed, and when that didn't work, I did what you non-native folks do all the time. I filed a lawsuit. But soon after that, well, I realized that maybe I wasn't going to be able to keep my promise. Maybe I wouldn't last long enough to bring Dad home. So I asked my brother if he could. January 2011. Bill enters. Remember when Dad used to take us out back to play football? Just about every Saturday. Even in the rain? He always passed to you. He passed to you? He passed to you first. Sure, I mean, I was the youngest. He always looked out for the baby. He was the strongest man on the face of this earth. When he saw someone weaker than him, he always stopped to help him out. This lawsuit, Jack, it's the right thing. I'm so glad you did it for us. I want you to be named the plaintiff. What? You mean... Instead of me. Uh, I don't know nothing about NAGPRA. You don't need to. We have a lawyer, a very good one. But you're doing such a great job. I'm, I'm dying. Don't say that. I have cancer. Your doctor said... I, I have a month, maybe two. And someone has to bring Dad home. We'll bury him next to you. I. I promise. July 16th, 2012, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Lawyer Steve Ward enters. What, what if I don't know what to say? Just answer his questions and listen for my objections. I'm nervous. You will do fine. Can we cancel? You have to testify. Why me? This is your lawsuit. Uh, this is Jack's lawsuit. And you joined it? Well, because he asked me to. Depositions are very intimidating, I know. I, I, I'm not intimidated. Remember what we discussed. If you don't know the answer to a question, you say, I don't know. But I don't know. I don't know what to say to convince these people to let us bring Dad home. If I knew, I would have said it by now. 
I would have said it years ago. I, I remember when Jack first ran for principal chief. I, I looked at him and I knew he, he had a plan. He was going to bring dad home, but, but now Jack's down there and I'm up here. And, and if I don't say the right thing, they won't let dad come home. Kind of makes me not want to say anything at all. William Schwab enters and sits on the other side of their table. A court reporter types everything. Bill enters and takes his seat. Mr. Thorpe, I'm the attorney for the borough of Jim Thorpe. I'll be asking you a few questions today. Now, you, you, you filed a complaint in the matter in which you've made an allegation that your father died in 1953, that his remains were shopped to several cities? My brother filed the complaint. Right. And he's passed now. I realize this. I'm just trying to understand. When your brother filed the complaint, what did he mean when he wrote that your father's remains were shot to several cities? Objection. Complaint speaks for itself. He filed it. I'm entitled to ask about it. You can answer the question. What was the question? How is it that you claim your father's remains were shot to several cities? To my knowledge, Patsy, his third wife, she came in and removed his body from a ceremony, our Indian bur burial ceremony, and that it was taking place with the Sac and Fox tribe. They, they came in with a hearse and a sheriff or a state patrol and, and took his body during a farewell dinner. Were you present? I was present, yes. How old were you at the time? At that time, I was probably, uh, coming out of the service, probably 25, 26 years old. Now, your father passed unexpectedly in 1953. Yes. Did you ever have a conversation with your father about the burial or his burial plans? As far as Daz was concerned, at, at different occasions through our lifetime, he had mentioned that he wanted to be put to rest in Oklahoma and in the tribal grounds. Did your dad have a will when he passed? To my knowledge, no. Were you aware? that Patsy entered into a contract with the borough of Mockchunk and East Mockchunk on May 19, 1954? Objection. Calls for a legal a conclusion? You can answer. I understand that they had something, but I, of course, wasn't there to know all the points of it all. Have you ever seen the contract? No. Were you aware that the two boroughs would, under the contract, have to merge and consolidate themselves under the name of Jim Thorpe? That's what I'd heard. Were you aware that the obligation would be binding on their heirs, administrators, executors, for so long as the borough of East Mockchunk and Mockchunk, parties here on two, are officially known or designated as Jim Thorpe? Okay. Now we're talking about heirs. Who put the heirs in there? We're the heirs, but we weren't aware of this. That was my question. Were you aware of this? No. Now, on paragraph 21 of your complaint, you've alleged that NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, that this act is a legal tool to prevent the exploitation and commercialization of remains of their ancestors and elders. Yeah. I'm sorry, was that a yes? Yes. Do you believe that the borough of Jim Thorpe is doing that today? Yes. Borough of Jim Thorpe. How are they doing that? I would say commercially. They're using my dad's remains to bring people to this town to visit. So, the borough of Jim Thorpe. You think they're exploiting your father's name? Commercially? I, I mean they're drawing money from his name and from his body. Uh-huh. And you live in Arlington, Texas? Yes. Okay. Is there an Arlington laundromat? I don't know. Is there an Arlington beer distributor? What about an Arlington library? Objection. You've made your point. Why don't you ask a question with some relevance to the issues in the case? Now, my understanding is that, and please correct me, because Pennsylvania is not rich with Indian heritage. Well, I shouldn't say that. We're rich with Indian heritage. Sure. But not with Indians in that we get familiar with their practices. OK. My understanding is once an Indian is buried in sanctified land that's now sacred, then his soul is at rest. Is that your understanding? 
I don't think it really would be. I mean, his burial should have been completed at the Sack and Fox ceremony, but it was interrupted. So his first ceremony was never completed? Never completed. But your half-sister, Grace, completed one in Pennsylvania. That wasn't a Sack and Fox completion. What you did was a ceremony from a different tribe. That's not who Dad was. So the Sack and Fox burial of your half-sister, Grace, in Pennsylvania. That wasn't a Sack and Fox burial. OK, if someone showed you that it was a Sack and Fox burial, would your opinion be different as to its legitimacy? No. We don't need you to show us what is not Sack and Fox. I know what Sack and Fox. And you aren't Sack and Fox. No further questions. We're off the record. Before my father's passing, no one had ever interrupted a Sack and Fox burial. So when Patsy walked in there and took his body, we didn't know what to do. We just sat there in shock. I remember I had my brother Bill next to me and my relative Henrietta. She was on my right. And suddenly, I don't know where, this white guy bursts in. Henrietta gasped. Bill grabbed my hand. We knew something was wrong. The state trooper, he came in the wrong door. The door he came through, that was the door for death. Only the dead come in and out that door. October 23rd, 2012, Lytton, Pennsylvania. The court reporter enters and sits, typing every word that's spoken. Mr. Safranco, would you please state your name for the record? Michael J. Safranco. Mr. Safranco, do you hold a public office with the defendant, the borough of Jim Thorpe? Yes, I am currently the elected mayor. Are you a resident of the borough of Jim Thorpe? Yes, lifelong resident. Mr. Safranco, why was Jim Thorpe buried in the borough? I think I would tell you that my understanding would be from what history tells me they were looking for a place to honor the athlete, to honor his many accomplishments. Um, Patricia Thorpe had been looking for that and a place that would rightfully honor her husband. So, just to be clear, you never met with her, Patricia Thorpe? No, uh, Joseph Boyle, along with members of that committee, would have sat down and met with her and said, you know, we would like to honor him and show truly what he deserves for his accomplishments. And this is the reason Jim Thorpe would have been buried there. That would be the overwhelming reason as to why he was there. Were there other reasons? Obviously, the two towns coming together and to have one unified name would be a second reason because there were reasons the two boroughs needed to come together. And, you know, we were going to be East Mock Chunk, Upper Mock Chunk, West Mock Chunk, whatever chunk. Well, all that would have been an issue. I wanted to interrupt. So by having one common name for the entire borough would have been a second reason. But of course I didn't. I couldn't. Getting that together would have been, that all would have been the reason, yes. One final question. I wanted to ask. Do you have proof of the contract you claim to have signed? Why won't you let my dad come home? There was a contract, but then again, you're asking me if I have proof of that or any documentation on that, and I can't show you that. But if I could take you back to 1954, I'm sure I could take you to a coffee shop. I'm sure I could take you to a breakfast area and say, hey, they sat down at a kitchen table or dining room table, or they sat down in a diner and discussed, hey, what are you going to do about this? But as far as the official borough documentation that I could show you, this was being discussed at the time. No, I have nothing that I, as the mayor right now, can show you. But Patricia Thorpe showed up, and they signed a contract. Thank you. That concludes my questioning. It's 3.36 PM Eastern Standard Time, October 23rd, 2012. We're off the record. Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It's a little thing Congress put together and passed in 1990 for our civil rights, Native American human rights. When Congress found out about a serious problem in America, for some reason a lot of non-Native folks think they should be able to buy and sell our remains and the remains of our ancestors, our hair and bones and skulls. Scientists were digging up our heads to study them. Some were collecting our bones for trophies. Others were using them as tourist attractions. But we're human, we're people. And just like any other folks, we have the inalienable right to be buried in the same soil as our relatives and have our ashes, our ashes sent to the many directions from places of our choosing. 
NAGPRA recognized that we have that right. And then this court in Pennsylvania denied it. Michael Safranco and secretary enter the mayor's office in the borough of Jim Thorpe, February 2015. We won. Feels good, doesn't it? I didn't think we'd win. I wasn't sure. But we signed a contract. Yeah, well, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a common citizen. And as a common citizen, I always thought a contract was a contract, no matter how you sliced it. But apparently, some instances, it's not. You aren't a common citizen. You're our mayor. I'm just glad we won. Glad we got the district court overturned. You know, I voted for you twice. Thank you. And I think you're doing an amazing job. I don't know how you do it. I get out of bed every morning. That's the first step. So if we won, that means no more depositions, no more late night brief readings, no more long conference calls. It's over. This is the American legal system. It's never over. You just said we won the appeal. In the Third Circuit, they could appeal to the Supreme Court. My dad always talked about before when this was mock chunk, back when we had coal mines. By the time my dad was old enough to work, the mines were all shut down. <sighs> we don't have mines anymore, and we don't have that beautiful ridge above the river. But so Daddy always said, Jim Thorpe's all we have. Where the folks used to come and hike, cause the mine, that away. So all we got in this town is a dead Indian. We buried here and we're honoring him. They won't ever take that away from us. And we won't let them. Michael Safranco and Secretary exit. Steve Ward and Bill enter. Tulsa, Oklahoma, February 2015. We lost. How is that possible? Appellate court says Judge Caputo got it wrong, that NAGPRA doesn't apply. They said that applying the plain text of the statute here would lead to a result that Congress never intended. They think Congress didn't intend for dad to be returned home? Right. Under the statute, we win, but they applied the absurdity doctrine. What's that? It's a doctrine that courts apply when they don't like the result of applying the plain language of a statute. They call that a doctrine? I agree. It's, it's absurd. I tell you it's absurd. Interrupting a Sack and Fox burial ceremony and selling someone's body for money. I know you're upset. We have to appeal. Sure. You said after the argument in the Third Circuit, if we lose, we have the option of appealing to the Supreme Court. We do. You don't think we should? Indians lose about 98% of the cases they bring to the Supreme Court. Then why do they keep bringing them? There's nowhere else to go. I told my brother I'd never give up. I made him a promise. OK, I'm just telling you, Indians don't have a good track record in front of the court. Dad always said he never saw a record he couldn't break. In the cemetery where everything began, Sack and Fox Nation. Bill stands in front of Jack's grave. Some prayer tobacco for you, brother. I, uh, I guess you know by now we lost in the appeals court. I, I don't know what went wrong. I, I really thought for a moment there we were going to bring Dad home. I'm sorry, Jack. You're here. Dad's still in Pennsylvania. This isn't the way things were supposed to be. But we're going to appeal to the Supreme Court. I'll never give up. Someday. We'll bring him home. Someday. We'll finish his ceremony. I, I promise. promise. The end. Thank you. Um, we are going to have a talk back now. Uh, welcome Mary Catherine Nagel back up to the stage. One of the playwrights. <laughs> Thank you so much for that fabulous reading. It was 
Really powerful. And now we have um, just a little bit of time, I think, until 1.30 um, when we, we have to give over the space to have a short talk back. And we have here with us um, Suzanne Schoen Harjo, um, one of the two playwrights. And we also have John Echohawk, who's the executive director of the Native American Rights Fund. And uh, NARF has been very involved in this campaign, um, both as um, the author of the NCAI amicus brief asking for the Supreme Court to review the Third Circuit's decision. And also, um, if you're familiar with Richard Guest and the work he does with the Tribal Supreme Court Project in um, trying to reverse that really horrible record that the Supreme Court has created for itself where uh, they oftentimes come down on the opposite side of Indian country. So, um, John and, and Suzanne, would you like to come up here or would you rather talk from your seats? We can hand microphones. Um, the idea is we'll take uh, questions from the audience, and uh, I have a, a Twitter feed here for those of you at home in case anyone would like to tweet in a question. And we'll, we'll keep the actors and the director up here too, and then that way, if, um, if folks have questions for, um, you know, any of the artists uh, in addition to the playwrights, uh, they will remain up here. Thank you, cast. Thank you. Thank you, director. Thank you, Mary Catherine. <laughs> Thank you, audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Mary Catherine and I uh, wrote this play for a contest with, that the Autry gave in uh, performing arts for short plays, and we did it on a moment's notice. And we were selected, we won, um, for the, the final five. And uh, so we felt like we had won the lottery. That was wonderful. And because winning for the final five meant that your play was performed at the Autry. Uh, one of five, and then they selected one. And although they selected another worthy play, um, ours was one of them that, that they uh, deemed worthy for performance. And then not too long after that, the, um, uh, while the Third Circuit was still deliberating, we took the play to the University of Pennsylvania Museum to the Cultural Heritage Center there and um, had a performance by a local troupe and local director. And we um, had followed that by a panel, uh, Richard Leventhal, the head of the Cultural, Resources, uh, Cultural um, Heritage Center, Lucy Fowler Williams, the keeper of the North American collection, at UPenn, and one reason that I wanted especially the play to be done at UPenn Museum is that it's the leading archaeology museum. And we thought maybe this could get out in the, in the world of uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania that if the leading archaeology museum could, lend, could get behind bringing Jim Thorpe home, that um, uh, the rest of them could get in line as well. So uh, we also had um, uh, Chief uh, George Thurman from the Sac and Fox Nation, 
and um, one of his staff members, and John Echohawk from Native American Rights Fund. And it was um, a really interesting panel, a uh, full auditorium there. And the, it was uh, simulcast by HowlRound, so uh, live cast, uh, live streamed. So we got a lot of good coverage. Unfortunately, it was the week after the, the, the Third Circuit made its decision. And then we moved to Oklahoma City to the uh, Sovereignty Symposium. And I was invited to be on a bunch of panels at the Sovereignty Symposium. And they asked me what else I would like to do. And I said, I would like to have the play done. And they um, agreed to that and, and really did it upright. The uh, Sovereignty Symposium in Oklahoma is a big deal in Oklahoma legal circuits. Um, it, it is, it is um, uh, sponsored by the state Supreme Court justices, and this performance was hosted by them in the Judiciary Center, uh, right next to the state capitol, and right before the, the main reception for the sovereignty panel. So they really accorded us a place of honor to do this. And we also had a panel during the so Sovereignty Symposium. And on the same day, which coincided with the cert, uh, with the announcement of the petition for certiorari uh, before the Supreme Court, uh, the play was done at noon, uh, right before that press conference uh, in the atrium of the lawyer's office. And uh, so then that was the lead in also to the, um, to the uh, announcement of the petition for cert. And we had a wonderful cast uh, uh, led by an old friend of mine, a uh, really old friend of mine. We're both old friends uh, from the 60s, Richard Ray Whitman, uh, who, who's such a great actor. And he graced us with his presence in, in, uh, in our play. So um, it is now my privilege to turn this over to another uh, dear friend, not quite so old, John Echohawk. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm uh, very pleased to uh, participate with uh, you and Mary Catherine and, and the actors in a reading of this, uh, of this play again because it uh, uh, very, very clearly uh, lays out the injustice that's at stake in, in this case. It's um, uh, an issue that's been uh, pursued by the Thorpe family and the Sac and Fox Nation of Oklahoma uh, for, uh, for many years. They uh, were successful as, as the play laid out in, uh, 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 in the district court in Pennsylvania, establishing that the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act uh, requires uh, repatriation of Jim Thorpe's body. As again, the play laid out, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in a very uh, uh, rarely uh, in invoked uh, situation used this absurdity doctrine where they uh, threw out the plain language in the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act that. Uh, on its face applies to uh, 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 governmental units like, like the city that are in possession of, uh, of native remains uh, to repatriate. And uh, the Third Circuit not understanding these issues basically uh, threw the law out the window under this so-called absurdity doctrine. So it's really uh, uh, a situation where there's no choice for the family and the, and the Sac and Fox Nation but to uh, seek to have the United States Supreme Court review this decision. And uh, as Suzanne mentioned, that uh, petition for review was filed uh, in the Supreme Court uh, in June earlier, earlier this month. And uh, uh, we were uh, uh, honored and privileged at the Native American Rights Fund under the Tribal Supreme Court project that we operate together with the National Congress of American Indians to uh, uh, participate uh, in this case. Uh, we have uh, 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 in the works uh, preparation of uh, 
a friend of the court amicus curiae brief for the National Congress of American Indians that will also be uh, filed with the U.S. Supreme Court here this week. Uh, our uh, uh, primary author of that brief from the Native American Rights Fund is staff attorney Matt Campbell sitting in the back there. He's been working really hard on this brief and it's just about ready to go. We really appreciate Matt's effort. Um, the uh, Association on American Indian Affairs will also be filing an amicus curiae brief uh, in the case uh, and uh, that brief will be uh, filed on behalf of Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell, uh, as you know, in Northern Cheyenne, who is a former U.S. Senator who was uh, very instrumental in the passage of, uh, of the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act in 1990, together with uh, then Congressman Bill Richardson from, uh, from New Mexico, of course, who's since gone on to be a governor of New Mexico and U.N. ambassador and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but uh, uh, Bill Richardson knows what he's talking about as well. And in addition to that, uh, uh, the uh, current uh, co-chair of the Native American Caucus, uh, Tom Cole, who's a member of the Chickasaw Nation, he is on the brief as well that's being written by the Association on American Indian Affairs. And uh, the uh, authors of, of that brief are here too, uh, Mary Catherine Nagel, who of course you already met, and then uh, I think Jack Trope, uh, is back there as well, and, and Jack worked on that, that brief too. So uh, it's getting uh, teed up for the United States Supreme Court uh, under the uh, process and procedure that they have. Uh, of course, there will be more uh, briefing in the case from uh, uh, the uh, uh, borough of Jim Thorpe and, uh, and others, and then the uh, Supreme Court will uh, decide whether it's going to hear the case or not, and that will probably be uh, uh, something they decide uh, when they uh, return for their fall term uh, in October. I think, as many of you know, the Supreme Court uh, went out of session here just earlier this week. I think maybe maybe today, I think, is, there, is the last official day, or maybe tomorrow. But anyway, the court takes the summer off, so uh, uh, these briefs will be filed over the summer, and then when the court comes back in the fall, then it will decide whether it's going to hear this case or not. And of course, we're we're very hopeful that they will. As uh, you know, as, as the uh, play points out, uh, Native people do not do very well under this current United States Supreme Court. So uh, uh, there's not a lot of uh, 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 hope for this. But um, you know, hope springs eternal, and maybe the court will finally do the right thing here and uh, correct this injustice. Uh, we're uh, at the same time working with NCAI and Suzanne and Mary Catherine and everyone else to publicize this case because as the play l lays out, there's uh, you know, a real uh, story behind uh, uh, this case that, that needs to be told and hopefully the uh, justices uh, get wind of that and uh, they do more than just you know, read the briefs and think about that, they really understand that this is a basic human rights issue and that uh, it's something that, uh, that they need to do something about. So uh, we all hope and pray that, uh, that the court will choose to hear this case in the fall and, uh, and take it up and uh, apply the law as uh, written by uh, Senator Campbell and Congressman Richardson and, uh, and supported by Congressman Cole today. Uh, it, um, Again, it's a situation where the, where the law is clear that uh, these were the kinds of uh, situations that the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act uh, was designed to, to stop, to end, and it's just not right for a court just to say it would be absurd to apply this law since they really don't know much about it or know much about Indians or, or anything, of course, which is a big problem we all have, but, uh, uh, you know, hopefully the Supreme Court will uh, see its way clear to, to take this case and, uh, and do the right thing. So uh, that's where we're at today. I, th I think with that, Mary Catherine, Suzanne, we're open to questions. There's a, there's a microphone. Hey, thank you today. This is very good. Um, how does the Supreme Court decide whether to hear a case or not? The U.S. Supreme Court gets uh, 
uh, you know, it's the court of last resort, gets many, many petitions to review lower court decisions. And uh, 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 of course, they've only got uh, so much time from the time they come in in October to the time they, they uh, end their session in June to hear these cases. So uh, even though they have, I think, thousands of petitions, there's only a handful of cases that they can take. And by handful, I mean maybe, you know, 70 or 80 or something like that. So a very small percentage of these petitions actually get granted by the court. And of course, they, in their judgment, take the cases that are most important to the nation. And so that's, that's kind of the criteria they use. And hopefully, uh, this case will be one of those that, that, uh, that they take. Could it be uh, sent back to the lower court to rehear it? Well, if the Supreme Court decided that, yes, yes, they could, and that that's one of the options. They could uh, just, in a very short order, uh, say uh, um, the judgment of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals is vacated and it's uh, remanded for further consideration, which would be hopefully uh, a word to the <coughs> Third Circuit Court of Appeals that this absurdity, do absurdity doctrine is absurd and they need to hear you know, the, the case on the merits and, and apply the law. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry, during the uh, introductions to your group, uh, I wasn't sure if anybody, I wasn't sure if any of you are, uh, have Meskwaki ancestry or Potawatomi, but I was curious about such an awesome job you guys did and gals did. Anybody, Meskwaki or Potawatomi or no? Different tribes? Okay. Uh, we, we can tell you what our tribal affiliations are. Um, I'm Navajo. I'm Mexican, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ojibwe from uh, Boys Port. Whiter. Ojibwe from Red Lake. Uh, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, North Dakota. Thank you. Uh, Cheyenne uh, and Hodogie, Muskogee. Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. Pawnee Nation. Uh, my name is Joseph Giovanetti. I'm finishing a book right now on uh, a definitive book, 800 pages, on the American Indians who have played Major League Baseball. Who what? On the American Indians who have played Major League Baseball. And uh, I wrote to 10,000 Major League Baseball players asking about their backgrounds. And uh, the book will be coming out next year, uh, Carolina Academic Press. It has about 500 photos in it, including uh, Moses Yellow Horse, uh, Chief Bender, uh, Jim Thorpe, um, hundreds and hundreds of American Indians from about 60 tribes. And I had a chance to meet uh, Grace Thorpe uh, once in 1995, the Giants honored her at Candlestick. And uh, she was delightful to talk to. She said that, you know, when they call me and ask me who's better, Michael Jordan or your father, Jim Thorpe, she said, I always ask them, how many sports did Michael Jordan play? <laughs> <laughs> and I think she, she made her point. And uh, the other thing she told me, I got to talk to her for a second. She said, when my, when my dad went to um, Carlisle, um, my grandfather, Hiram, had to uh, sign an agreement saying he could not come home for five years. <laughs> but I don't think that stopped him from coming home. Thank you. Grace was a friend of mine, and, and Jack was a friend of mine. And um, I'm just now meeting <coughs> and um, becoming friends with Bill. And his resolve is as strong as it was the day he came back from Korea and saw his father taken out the wrong door, the door of death, in front of him. Instead of going through with the renaming ceremony um, and <clears throat> the turning back of the name, uh, his Indian name, to the clan, to his Thunder Clan, and then being buried. So that's what was interrupted. <clears throat> so we're dealing here with people who are, <clears throat> excuse me, who are living relatives, who are living witnesses to that having happened. And John and I are living participants in the development of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which 
we started in 1967 and continued through to seven to 89 and and um, 90, 89 when we got the historic repatriation provision in the National Museum of the American Indian Act. These are not things that are abstract to us. These are not things that the Third Circuit can tell us anything about. And it is really absurd for them to try to tell members of Congress who well know what the intent of Congress was, what the intent of Congress was. These are acts that passed on unanimous consent. How can the Third Circuit substitute its judgment for all of Congress's judgment? That's what I think is absurd. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Yellowwash. I'm the from the Yakima Nation, and uh, I was listening to the script there. In one part, it said that he. Uh, I guess there was somebody that was speaking for the elder that he had a right under NAGPRA to be uh, laid to rest in his tribal land. Is that was that part of the script? Uh, did I hear that right? I so. Somebody said yeah. that he has a right. So John, um, we're dealing with um, what we call the ancient one. Um, uh, Kennewick man. Yes, and um, so we just got some good results from. Um, from a, a, a DNA uh, result, and our case is much stronger. So my question is, um, uh, if um, or when uh, we prevail, and this would this strengthen like those arguments um, under NAGPRA that we're it's been 20 years since we've tried to um, uh, put him, you know, respectfully away and under our traditions. So. I'm just curious about this argument and this uh, absurdity doctrine. I, um, <coughs> has it been the courts or there's cases that uh, where this uh, has been used or you know, I guess there's about two or three questions I have, but I just, I'm just curious about the success of the appeal and how that w would affect like, for instance, our situation uh, with the ancient one and uh, utilizing NAGPRA uh, you know, to uh, get our elder back and uh, you know, have a proper burial. I think many of you know about that, uh, about that case, that Kennewick Man case, where uh, uh, remains were, were found up in, up in the northwest area and, uh, uh, you know, the tribes, uh, you know, laid claim to the, the, those remains, and it uh, ended up in, in court lawsuit filed by some scientists. And uh, uh, we talk about an absurd result. You know, it ended up in the Ninth Circuit. You know, deciding that uh, uh, somehow th th these remains were too old to be native, and <laughs> you know that there was people here before us, and we, you know, oh, you know, and so uh, they they took the remains away, and then of course, you know. As they do, they study, 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 and then the studies just recently came out, a lot of publicity about it, and guess what? The remains are native, native remains, so things are in the works, as I understand it, to get everybody to recognize that, and then, then return the remains to, to the people who they belong to for proper burial, and so uh, hopefully all that's going to happen, and uh, with the publicity that's received, I, I would hope that that would be something that would help uh, educate the Supreme Court about NAGPRA and these issues and how uh, it, the law should work and maybe heighten their awareness about how the law should work in the Jim Thorpe case, case as well. That's, that, that's my hope. What they don't know and what's not before them, unfortunately, is that the scientists who were opposed to the Columbia River tribes getting back the ancient one for reburial, and they never say that he was buried to begin with, that he was buried along the Columbia River. They just say he was found as if he were just lost some, by someone, maybe himself, along the Columbia River, and, and he was found you know, 9,000 years later. He was buried by them. 
they wanted to rebury him. Uh, they weren't even in the suit, though. They were just part of, they were just, they just had an amicus brief. They, it was the Army Corps of Engineers in the suit. But those scientists were opposed, they're the ones who fought us consistently again to, against getting NAGPRA in the first place. They're from the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian derivatives, the ones who have the big Smithsonian contracts for archaeology. <clears throat> and they are the ones who fought us, fought us, fought us, and then once NAGPRA was law, they fought, fought, fought to, to dismantle it, including the ancient one litigation that went on for so long. And they even had the results because the, the Danish firm that did the consultants that did the DNA study that shown he, that the ancient one was Native American uh, and probably Colville, are, uh, they, they work for the Smithsonian. I mean, they're the, one of the main consultants there. So the Smithsonian and those scientists had those results over six months ago but the scientists threw such a hissy fit that they had to go back and redo certain parts of the DNA analysis again, and it still came out the same way. And so then they couldn't put it off anymore, so then it became public. So that's how we got, that's a quick view of how we got from there to here. And there are people who are working with the, the opponents of Jim Thorpe going home who are in that same battle. They never wanted NAGPRA to begin with. They never wanted repatriations to go forward to begin with. And now they're trying to conclude it one Native American at, the to at a time. So bring Jim Thorpe home and don't leave this room without signing or taking with you this petition, this letter, uh, open letter to the mayor, council, and citizens of the bureau, the bureau, the borough of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. And there's a signature seat, uh, sheet, a uh, cover letter. So take one home or fill one out and uh, leave it with us or send it to the address in the red box below. Uh, at the bottom of the page, it'll tell you where to send it. You have another question? Yeah, my name is Tom LeBlanc. I'm assistant in Wapping, Dakota. In 1990, uh, Dennis Banks and about 14 uh, native runners, I was one of them, uh, ran on what we call the Great Jim Thorpe Run from Onondaga to San Francisco to help get back uh, his gold medals. And um, the publicity from that helped get back those gold medals, even though they were re replicas. And uh, I didn't realize that this just goes on with Jim Thorpe. And that I think a uh, key maybe is publicity. Because the thing that uh, got back the gold medals was uh, like these petitions and, and publicity. Because um, this case is somewhat unknown, even mm -hmm. in the native world. So I think we need to somehow work on publicity to get him back home. Thanks. Well, we're so happy <coughs> that our brother Dennis Max uh, organized that run, and uh, we urge him to do so again. <laughs> Here's another one for him. If we can suit up and <laughs> <laughs> do this, so can he. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that um, I have a lot more petitions, so if anyone here today would like to take extra copies home and just hand them out to people who can fill them out and you can put them in the snail mail or you can scan them and email them. I'm sure if you have a youth to help you, you could figure out a way to send it from a smartphone. Um, mm. You know, there's multiple <laughs> different ways to get it to Sac and Fox Nation, and for those of you who may be tuning in from home on HowlRound, um, if you go to um, NARF's website, and if you just, you can just Google Native American, if you just Google Native American Rights Fund and Jim Thorpe, it'll take you directly to that, it's the easiest way just to get to that page, and the petition's online, actually on that page. And, um, and for those of you who use Twitter, you can look at hashtag bring Jim Thorpe home, 
and you'll see lots of tweets that will lead you in that direction. So I think, yeah, the more people can share this petition and also just share the story and um, talk about it, tweet about it, post on Facebook about it. Um, as you all know, it's such an atrocity that a lot of people just don't even know about. So the more people that know about it, um, the more likely it is that there'll be pressure on the borough to let him come home. And, and do we need to close, Mary Catherine? Um, it's a little bit after 1.30. We have one more question. Do we? I think we have time for another question. I don't see anyone from NCAI telling us to stop, so. Okay, well, let's, <laughs> let's keep going. Stay here until we're told. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Roman Powell. I'm uh, Muskogee Creek from Oklahoma. Uh, question I have, like you say, with the uh, repatriation and everything and NACRA. A lot of stuff that we hear out here in Indian country is that there again, it has to do with the state. You know, we have federal laws that are supposed to be there to protect, protect us in this. And you know, the remains of our ancestors and you know, uh, whether it's funerary objects or you know, sacred sites, all this falls un under a NACRA. But yet, what can be done to make the states adhere to those federal laws. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, you, I hear that, you know, you might have to go to the United Nations to get the U.S. to enforce those things. So what can be done, whether through NCAI or whatever other organization, legal or whatever, to get something in place that will make the federal government, make the states adhere to those laws? Because it comes back down to whether it's uh, NACRA, repatriation, tobacco, I mean, all along these lines, the state seems like they have that authority and a lot of nations are supposed to be sovereign. But then, you know, we let the states dictate to some of these tribes that what we can and can't do. Is there some thoughts or maybe something in the works that could be done to maybe address that that will help others in the future? Well, these are the issues that uh, uh, go on and on and on, and of course that's a, a major reason why the tribes came together and formed the National Congress of American Indians uh, uh, back in 1944, and it's uh, uh, a continuing effort. We always have issues out there and we have to use every avenue we can to try to get those, those addressed and one of those avenues is, uh, is the courts. Other avenues are of course the, the Congress, uh, the administration, the United Nations and we have to use all of those whatever's at our disposal to try to deal with the issues at hand. Um, uh, just in, in mentioning the United Nations, of course, I think as many of you know, in 2007, they passed the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that the United States uh, subsequently endorsed. Uh, President Obama uh, signed the United States of America onto that, uh, th that uh, supporting uh, uh, effort. And uh, uh, one of the articles in the Declaration basically uh, uh, talks about repatriation and so you know, under these international standards relating to indigenous rights, the, there's a right to repatriation. And so we need to have people understand that and, uh, and adhere to that standard. I mean, that's, uh, again, something else we use. We have domestic law, we have international law, and you know, somebody do something and you know, we're all trying. And, you know, and, and as the place said, we never give up, even if the Supreme Court denies review. I mean, this isn't over there. Are there things that, uh, that the Thorpe family and the Second Fox Nation and, and tribes can do to try to convince the borough to do the right thing, and uh, that will be next if, uh, if the appeal fails. Hello. Um, do we have one last question? I see a hand. Could you come to the microphone, or could somebody hand her the microphone? lawyer's question. I have a sad lawyer's question. My concern is not so much the Supreme Court would deny review, but that it would take it up. 
in the context of a court that has been willing to tolerate the stealing of Indian future through the ICWA, and that it might tolerate equally the stealing of Indian past through its uh, new interpretation of NAGPRA. Um, I'm sure you're thinking about that, John, because that's what we all think about. And I just see a pattern of there's stolen land, there's stolen future, and there's stolen past. And Jim Thorpe sort of bridged all of that by being stolen away to the boarding school. And I guess I'm just sad thinking about the possibilities. I guess that might give you another act, Suzanne. Yeah, it's possible if the court did take the case that they wouldn't do what we think they should do and they make things even worse. I mean, that's that's a possibility, yes, but it's... Was, was there, in fact, an enforceable contract? Was I, I, I heard in your text that no one's seen the contract. How was this an enforceable position? Well, that's, that's a good question. And I mean, just leave aside an act for Courts never really got to that issue at all, and I, I think you know, federal law is federal law. And of course, this, this is an issue that would have been taken up by the uh, NAGPRA review committee under the NAGPRA process mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. okay. the court would have said uh, the law applies. Then that's the next step in the process as it goes to the NAGPRA review committee, and that's when uh, the borough and whoever else could come in and say, "Well, we have a contract," and then the review committee has to figure out whether that's relevant or not, or whether whether you know, federal law applies, and so the contract's no good. Federal law applies over state law, and so, you know, all those issues never really got aired because state, they short-circuited the process. But state law permits trafficking in human bodies? That's what they would have had to talk about. <laughs> and I don't think they would have come out in favor of the borough on that issue. I just would like to uh, make a couple comments. I'll be very brief. I know folks are wrapping up, uh, but my name is Brendan Ludwig. I'm an attorney. I represent the Muskogee Creek Nation, Hickory Ground Tribal Town. Uh, Nico, George Thompson, and some of the other folks from Hickory Ground Ceremonial Ground are here uh, in support of uh, uh, the relatives of, and descendants of Jim Thorpe and their efforts. Uh, just to really briefly encapsulate uh, the issue that we're working on, uh, where the 57 ancestors were excavated uh, from the ceremonial ground. Uh, down in Wetumpka, Alabama by a newly recognized tribe for a casino project. Um, unfortunately, uh, my clients, Muskoi Creek Nation, Hickory Ground, have been uh, fighting that effort and trying to preserve that sacred place and trying to uh, ensure that their ancestors uh, were reinterred uh, at the uh, burial sites where they were excavated. Um, we also have a petition like yours. I'm sure our clients will be happy to uh, join in your fight and assist you in any way that they can. Uh, we would also ask that you take a look at the information that we have uh, as there are uh, many similar issues regarding the sacredness of the ancestors and, uh, and uh, the respect uh, for the ancestors uh, that, that uh, uh, of course, Jim Thorpe is entitled to, as, as are the ancestors of the Creek Nation. Uh, so we'd like to join with you and support your efforts and provide you with the information. Uh, thank you for your time. Mado. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much for, um, for listening today. And uh, again, the play we read was My Father's Bones by Mary Catherine Nagel and Susan, Suzanne Schoen Harjo. Thank you so much. Uh, New Native Theater has been honored to be part of this conference and to read this play. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>